Okay. When I say viewer discretion, I really mean viewer discretion. If you are um, somebody who doesn't like snakes, you don't like snakes. Okay. All right. But remember, the snakes are just on the screen. All right. Uh, no, I hate snakes completely. I can't even think about it. But anyway, it's something we have to study. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, let's see. Let's get the laser pointer up at least. And, right. So, Toxinology, okay. So toxicology is the study of toxin. Uh, your paracetamol poisoning, organophosphates, all of that. Toxinology is the study of toxins, all right, which are rather, uh, how can I put it, things like snake bites, scorpion bites, spider bites, things like that. So we'll try and cover as much about uh, snake bites as we can today. And uh, if we don't finish, it's not a problem. You can always do it over the next few weeks as well, all right? So let's start. So this is a basic definition, all right? If you bite something, all right, and you die, it's regarded as poisonous, all right? So for example, a mushroom, okay? If you bite it and you die, it's, it's a poisonous mushroom. But if something bites you and you die, then it's venomous, okay? So snakes are venomous, scorpions are venomous, things like that, all right? and it, it bites you and it dies, then there's something wrong with you. Okay, uh, <laughs> things should not die from biting us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so snake bites, okay. So there's three broad classes, okay, of the toxins that come out from snakes, all right? So hemotoxic, cytotoxic, and neurotoxic, all right? So they're almost self-explanatory. So what do you think hemotoxic does? Attacks the blood. In what way do you think it would attack the blood? Almost there, yeah, yeah. Think of another part of your blood. What other parts do you have to your blood, except for your red blood cells? There's other parts to your blood. Blood cells, definitely. Another part? Plasma. Okay, plasma. Platelets. Platelets, very good. Okay, so what's the easiest way to kill you through your bloodstream? Yes, make you bleed out. How would you bleed out? So if you can't clot, uh, hello. Okay, yeah. So if you can't clot, you're going to die. Or alternatively, if you clot too much, you're gonna die, all right. So actually the hemotoxic toxins tend to attack the uh, platelets, all right. So I'll show you now, the one we have in South Africa makes you bleed out, okay. And uh, the ones they have overseas, like a couple of the American vipers and things like that, they actually cause uh, coagulation, all right. Cytotoxic, what do you think it does? Cytophore, cell, all right, so cell toxic. Right. So what do you think it would do to cells? Destroy Just destroy them. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So cytotoxic uh, toxins, what they do is that they attack the cells that are, well, within range. Let's put it that way. So the bite happens in the arm. They start destroying cells around the arm. And basically, they don't differentiate between a squamous cell, an epithelial cell, a glandular cell. They just destroy everything, all right? So whatever's in the skin, the muscle, the adipose, everything gets destroyed around there. So what do you think you'll see in those types of patients? Well, necrosis. How's it, guys? You all okay? Come. Hi. Come, 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 sit. We try to... You can follow there. I can follow here, wherever it is. All right, so we're just discussing the three types of toxins that you get from, uh, from snakes. We're gonna try and get as far as we can. We're not gonna to take too long. Okay. And uh, if we don't finish, we don't finish. It's one of those things, all right? But it's better just to understand. So basically you expect necrosis, all right? So not necessarily necrotizing fasciitis, but you're right, you know, it's, uh, it's a necrosis, death of cells, they're all just gonna die and fall off, all right? And then neurotoxic, what do you expect to see? Very good. Yeah, the nerves. And the quickest way to kill you by attacking the nerves would be? Yeah, paralysis. But what I mean is uh, central or peripheral? In other words, if I, if I numbed your arm, 
or if I attacked your brain, which would kill you faster? Yeah, very good. So they tend to attack centrally, all right? So um, when they attack centrally, they, uh, what's the quickest way to kill somebody? Yeah, I shoot them in the head, true. But if you were looking at the central nervous system and what it controls, considering heartbeat, breathing, thinking, logic. Uh, so either make your heart stop or make your brain stop, all right? So in other words, the neurotoxins eventually cause bradycardia, arrhythmia, uh, inability to control the diaphragm and breathe and things like that, all right? So they tend to attack the midbrain, all right? The old lizard brain that we have, all right? The, the pons and the medulla and all those areas that control this. So these are the three types, okay? So snakes are designed to kill you, but not all of them, all right? And uh, basically from the three uh, types of toxins, we see basically five types of clinical syndromes, all right? So all the syndromes have pain. That's one thing that's very common in a snake bite, all right? It's very rare to have a painless snake bite, okay? So for example, now you don't have to memorize this table. It's just to give you an example. So for example, a cytotoxic, one that kills off the cell, you'll get pain, you'll get swelling because it's attacking the cells, right? So apoptosis, regional edema, all of that is happening. And then you get cytotoxicity, but you won't get neurotoxicity or coagulopathy or hemotoxicity, all right? Now with the neurotoxic one, you'll get pain, but you won't get swelling necessarily. You won't get destruction of the cells and you won't get uh, coagulopathy, okay? With the hemotoxic, of course, you get hemotoxicity, no neurotoxicity, no cytotoxicity. You get a bit of swelling and you get a bit of pain. Then if you have a neurotoxic, some of them cause pain and swelling, but not all, okay? And then you get the last variety, in other words, harmless snakes, where they bite you and you get pain and swelling and nothing else, okay? So those are basically the five different variants that we got. So it doesn't mean that if a patient is bitten, they're definitely going to die or you definitely have to give them antivenom. There's actually very specific circumstances where we give antivenom, and we'll get to that at some point, all right? So we're gonna talk about our common snakes in KZN, but uh, they kind of cover a very broad class. Uh, how many of you are from KZN originally? One, two, me, three, four. Okay, have you been bitten by a snake? Surprising, it's actually very common. But you've seen a snake, in the wild, yeah, okay. So snakes are kind of uh, not looking to kill us. It's not like they're hiding in the bushes waiting to strike. It's when we get into their territory that they get upset, all right? If they, they've got their eggs nearby or their nest nearby and things, and that's when snake bites happen, all right? So in KZN specifically, it's normally along riverbeds uh, in the bush. Okay, it's very rare to find them in urban settings unless the urban setting is close to a river, things like that. But it does happen. It's not to say it doesn't happen. Okay, so this is our big friend in Newcastle and surrounds, right? This is called the wrinkles. Okay, ugly looking mother, huh? Mm -hmm. I tell you. So it's a form of cobra. Okay, so these are the most common ones that we actually get in Newcastle, right? So it is a cytotoxic snake. All right, so its bite causes pain, significant swelling. Now, it, you know, it's not something you have to note down because these are the types of things you can just quickly check. Most hospitals, even us, we've got a little chart on the side of our emergency department that has all of the, the snakes and their, their, their significant features and things like that. So you can always figure out which snake you're looking at. The other alternative is that, uh, of course, most of your senior doctors will know as well. Um, and your poison control center will also, they'll ask you for a quick description and your location, and they can quickly map out what you're going to get. So for example, uh, here, it's unlikely that you'll find a bug adder. So it's very, if you start describing something like that, they'll, they'll know you're not, it's not that, let's put it that way, all right? Uh, we don't have uh, rattlesnakes, for example, in the whole of South Africa. So if you start describing something that sounds similar to that, they know they can discount it, okay? So just to give you an example, all right? So we're gonna look at a lot of pictures of snakes now. So if you don't like them, just close your eyes, okay? All right. So uh, Mozambican spitting cobra. Also very common as we start going towards Impangeni, Frey, that area, all right? So it's also cytotoxic. It's pain and swelling. 
And the spitting cobra has, well, its first form of defense, which is spitting, all right? So it normally aims for your eyes, all right? So that I discussed later on, but it can bite you as well. Okay, so this is the other one, all right? So it, when you look at the snake, you'll notice the differences in colors. So for example, the wrinkles tends to be more of a black snake with these typical markings, uh, you know, white to yellow markings, whereas your spitting cobra is more of a golden color with the black stripes and things like that. So it, sometimes people will describe sometimes and very commonly people actually beat the snake to death and then bring it in so that you can see what's going on okay right mambas who's from durban durban isn't it? mambas isn't it? everybody's click on these things over there all right because uh there we get them quite a bit right so uh, common belief black mambas are meant to be black green mambas are meant to be green. The actual truth is that it has to do with the inside of the mouth, right? So the black mamba, they say, when you see that, you're seeing death, all right? So neurotoxic, okay. So when you get this, you're gonna stop breathing and your heart's gonna stop and you're gonna get paralyzed, okay? And there's very minimal swelling, okay? So mamba is the, the main reason why we get so scared of them. They tend to be found in urban areas more commonly than the other ones, so that's why. There's a lot of mystique around them, if I can put it that way. And uh, the mystique's been created by the press as well, you know, that uh, mamba's gonna get you, you know. But mamba bites are actually not that common, surprisingly. They do happen, but it's not as though they're going around, or like they're the gangsters of the, of the snake world, you know. They, they also, it's only when they are threatened. So this is another one that we find worm slung. We don't find it too much in our area, but it is in KZN, all right? So the worm slung is a hemotoxic snake, all right? Hemotoxic, meaning that when it bites you, you will bleed to death, all right? So a very distinctive green color. It's found in trees, hence the name, all right? So for those who don't speak Afrikaans, worm, tree, slung, snake, all right? So they were very creative in their naming, all right? Mm -hmm. And this is one, especially if you work in uh, Ladysmith uh, around the Drakensberg, you can expect to see this, the Berg Adder. All right. So it's also neurotoxic. Right? It causes pain and marked swelling. And again, you can remember this if you want. If you don't remember all the specifics, it's not a problem. All right. So um, let's take, for example, why the, if you go back to Saudi, most of these snakes are not there. All right, you all have a completely different set of snakes, you know, but they also fall into the three classes, hemotoxic, cytotoxic, or neurotoxic. So each particular area will have its uh, own particular snakes, all right. Okay, and this is the Natal black snake. Now this snake, you can mess around with it as much as you want because it can't kill you, okay. So it's, it's a common garden snake. It gives you a bit of pain, gives you a bit of swelling, but it doesn't have any sort of systemic effects, all right. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like the security guard at the Victoria's Secrets uh, uh, ah. uh, runway show. He's only allowed to look at the audience. He's of no use, <laughs> if you get what I mean, all right? Yeah. So that's the Natal Black Snake. He got the worst deal, right? He's a snake, he's got the teeth, he can't do anything with it, all right? He's just there, all right, to occupy space. All right. Now, the, <laughs> the truth is, <laughs> okay, I'm being unfair. They actually play a vital role in the ecosystem. All right. They, yeah, no, no, no. They actually take out quite a few rodents and things like that. All right. So, yeah, but they, they mainly rely on sheer strength. All right. So, the physical force of their bite and things like that. But compared to the other snakes, like if the snakes were having a party, he'd be at the children's <laughs> table. You know what I mean? They'd be like, you know, you sit over there, you know. <laughs> Don't bite anything. Oh, never mind. You know, they'd be like that with him, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's unfortunately true. Yeah? Okay. All right. So those are the, now, now we're not finished, right? This is just to have a bit of a break. Okay. Now, <laughs> so like I say, now, these are the different types of snakes that we see. Okay. Now, when snakes bite you, there's two types of bites that we get, all right? We get what we call a dry bite, right? And we get a proper bite, okay? Now, 50% of the time when people get bitten, it's a dry bite. A dry bite is like a warning shot. 
The snake bites you, but doesn't put any venom into you. It's just giving you a warning. It's kind of saying, listen, if you make me do this again, you're in trouble. Okay. Now, when they do give you a venomous bite, that's normally somebody who's been quite threatening towards it. Okay. So if you do meet one of these things, you know, I'll turn and run. You, you may still get bitten, but chances are it will be a dry bite. But if you pick up a stick and threaten it and go for it, chances are you'll get a venomous bite. All right? Small kids, generally, because they're not aware of the danger, will try and play with the thing. You know, So they get uh, quite bad bites. Bigger children, not so much. They get dry bites. Okay. Uh, so these are just things to keep in mind. Okay. What's our time over there? Anyway. Okay, so we actually we've got a bit of time, all right. So we're going to talk about wrinkles and and cobras, all right. So these are these are cytotoxic snakes, all right. So we expect extensive cell damage to occur, all right. And when we say extensive, we really do mean extensive. So there's a lot of swelling that takes place, all right. So when patients get bitten with any sort of cytotoxic, the first thing that happens is swelling with severe pain. This is the one thing that sets them apart. They actually have severe, severe pain. I'm talking about people coming, screaming, all right? So that's when you know this is something dangerous as compared to a dry bite where there's been no venom injected. The reason for the pain is the apoptosis that's there, apoptosis cell death, uh, right? let's say rather than necrosis that's taking place, all right? So as these cells are busy dying, they are giving off quite a bit of uh, substance P and all of the other inflammatory markers, cytokines. So that's what's stimulating the nerve to give the pain signal, all right? Extensive swelling can occur. It generally does occur. And what they get is multiple blisters and bullet. All right. So this is where the cell death is taking place. And what's quite common with these is something that we call skip lesions. All right. Now, skip lesions has nothing to do with the washing powder skip. All right. What it means is that you have an area of death, normal tissue, area of death, normal tissue, area of death, normal tissue. And this actually tells you that, listen, this is a cytotoxic cobra wrinkles, all right, specifically in our area. And it's very, very pathognomic of those types of bites. Okay. So uh, I think I've got some pictures of them here. All right. So these are skip lesions. All right. So you can see young child, obviously a venomous bite. Okay. So wherever it occurred, it most likely occurred on the hand, on the elbow, somewhere over there. But you can see patches of normal skin and then complete destruction. All right, it's going right down into the muscle tissue over there. Okay, here's a patient who has bitten on their leg, and you can see a massive bullet that's starting over there. All right, and here's a patient who has bitten on the finger, and they're starting to get extensive swelling. Okay, now what does this remind you of? What else looks like this? <laughs> so, no, man, <laughs> it's true. I agree. Make me hungry. But <laughs> medical condition. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, you could say gangrene, but what I'm talking about, loss of skin with a very reddish burns. Very good. Okay. So, what are you expecting to happen? Like, what would happen with burns? Loss of fluid fluid all right and the thing is because the you see even with burns you, sometimes depending on the depth of the burn you still have some sort of protection with these everything's just getting destroyed right and it's going down in layers and layers and layers so the amount of fluid loss is actually quite extensive sometimes and they become very hypovolemic hyponatremic hypokalemic things like that. so you've got to start thinking in terms of a burn so you would work out the percentage, you would work out how much of fluid the patient needs, and you would start giving them. And how would you monitor whether you're giving enough? You'd insert a catheter. <clears throat> All right. Now, this type of patient is the one who will get antivenom, for example, but <clears throat> we'll get into antivenom in a, in a while. All right. I don't want to start with that because it's, it's, it's another section altogether. Right? Uh, the other thing you can see with this child is that you can actually see where the damage is actually taking place. All right. All the other skin around there that's actually going to die off eventually and peel off. So you actually affected that in as well. All right. Now with this patient, they've got a bite. It's affecting the leg, but it's just staying on the leg. All right. It's not leaking fluid currently. Nothing else is happening. So you're mainly going to control pain. Okay, understand. And the same thing with the patient here, right? You're mainly going to control pain. Now, when we decide to give antivenom is when there's rapid spread. 
So in other words, there's a large amount of venom that was injected. So you start getting things like this. So in other words, more than half the lung starts getting affected. Now with a lot of patients, even if they do have a venomous bite, but if there's not a lot of venom put in, we rather not give antivenom because in antivenom is one of those cases where the cure is as bad as the disease. Antivenom can kill you. All right, so you have to be very careful when we give it. So we don't rush to give antivenom, but we'll get to that in a little while. So the majority of these patients, we admit them, but well, not the majority, all of them. We admit them, we observe them, we see how it's spreading, and we eventually make a decision as to whether to give antivenom or not. All right. Now, what's happened uh, about, up till about three years ago, we had antivenom at Madadeni, and then it was decided that the antivenom would be centralized. So currently, Grays keeps all the antivenom, uh, Albert Latouli, those types of hospitals. So when there is a patient like this, we stabilize and pass them on. If they need antivenom, it's given there, all right? Um, so we don't have any, unfortunately. All right, so this is what they get, right? Hypovolemia due to extravasation of fluid, especially in children, all right? They're quite susceptible. They get compartment syndrome if it's around the calf and the forearm, simply because of the swelling that's occurring, all right? And thrombocytopenia, which is, what's thrombocytopenia? Hey? Eh? No. 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 What's thrombocytopenia? Hmm? You look it up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Low platelets. <laughs> so thrombocytopenia, low platelets, thrombocytosis. Too many platelets. Okay. So it's a common finding. It's unlikely to lead to life-threatening bleeds. Okay. Right. So creatinine kinase levels rise because of rhabdomyolysis. All right. So creatinine kinase is present in our muscles and in our tissues. So as they break down, the CK levels rise, just like what we'd see in a crush syndrome, uh, what we see in a myocardial infarction, all those types of things. All right. Uh, heat stroke, all of these things where there's muscle breakdown. So once there's muscle breakdown, then eventually you'll get renal dysfunction. All right. Because all of that uh, myoglobin has to go somewhere. So as a protein, it goes into your kidneys. And the one thing your kidneys hate is protein because it's a large molecule, it's difficult to filter. And if you put too many large ones, eventually it starts destroying the kidney, all right? So that's what we worried about. So the way to prevent that is fluids, okay. All right, now let's go to mambas, okay. So when you get bitten by a mamba, you get agitated, you get nervous, and you can't breathe, all right? So that's the type of patient that will come in if they have a mamba bite. Now, especially if you work in Durban, Stanger, the, 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 the peripheries, you'll find these, all right? So what happens? The patient starts getting a progressive descending flaccid paralysis, all right? So what do we mean by flaccid paralysis? Loss of tone, loss of reflexes, loss of power, all right? So it starts as paresthesia of the tongue and the lips, okay? That's the first part that starts to give you symptoms, all right? Then you start, and in a lot of poisonings, actually, that's the first thing that happens, paresthesia of the tongue and lips. Blurred vision, right? Ptosis. Anybody knows what ptosis is? Huh? Eyelid closing. All right. Eyelid just closing a little bit, right? So the eyelid staying like this. Can you see that? That's ptosis. Okay. All right. Dilated pupils. Okay. Now, don't stress. You don't have to remember all of this. This is the type of thing you can quickly Google. Mamba bite symptoms, and it will all come up. All right. Uh, dysarthria. Mm. Difficulty talking. Difficulty talking. All right. Sorry. Uh, you know, I, I don't blame you all. All right. These are not common terms. All right. So, dysarthria is another way of saying the facial muscles are getting weak. So, the patient is unable to form words and talk. All right. Dysphonia. Close. Hoarseness of the voice. All right. Dysphagia. D difficulty in swallowing, very good. And eventual respiratory failure. 
Okay, so you can see it, it's basically starting at the lips and then going backwards, all right, to affect everything in the face. And eventually it gets to the point where the vagus nerve is affected and your diaphragm can't move up and down, all right? So what are you going to do for these patients? You'll have to look after all of those things, all right? So what we'll normally see when these patients come in, trembling, muscle fasciculations, vomiting, chest and limb pain, hypersalivation, arrhythmias, right? It's similar to scorpion sing, spider bites, but we'll get to that later on, right? So generally, at least you get a history. You will know this is a snake bite, right? Or somebody will tell you this is a snake bite. So at least you know where to start, okay? So if you start seeing something like this, especially if there's arrhythmias, um, what you would call it, any sort of paresthesia anywhere, without much swelling, start thinking neurotoxic. This is a neurotoxic, all right? Because with cytotoxic, the patient will have swelling, breakdown, things like that, all right? So that's ptosis, okay, of the, the patient who's been bitten. Here we can see uh, what you might call it. This, now, this is actually to display loss of tone. All right, so the patient's leg is unable to lift up, all right? But it's also to show you how minimal the swelling is, even though the bite is there, okay? And in this one here also, we see loss of tone, okay? And you can't even see the bites. That's how bad it is. So it's very difficult to make out the bite marks, all right, from these, uh, from mambas. And that, okay. So the Berg adder, how are we doing? Okay. I'm going to go over half an hour. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to finish the Berg adder and then we're done, all right? So pray you never get bitten by the snake, all right? This is why I don't visit the bug anymore. And when I do, I always tell my family I'm feeling sick, I can't go for a hike. <laughs> I'm lazy as well, but that's the other reason, all right? So it has the same symptoms as a mamba bite because it's a neurotoxin, all right? The only difference is there's a lot of swelling, all right? So some of the particular things with the bug adder, they get hyponatremia, which is quite severe, and leads to convulsion, seizures, which happens with hyponatremia. And then they also get bullae and necrosis, but not as extensive as the wrinkles, all right? So a Berg adder, even though it's neurotoxic, there's a cytotoxic element to it as well, all right? Um, so the problem with the Berg adder is there is no treatment. In other words, no antivenom. It doesn't mean you will die. It just means that they have to give you supportive treatment until you recover, okay? So don't go to the Bergs under any circumstances. Do not visit it. Do not look at pictures of it. <laughs> no, but seriously, if you do ever go hiking in the bergs, you stick to the, to the proper routes. Otherwise, yeah, you could get into trouble. Okay. So this is just to show a bit of the swelling, a bit of the necrosis. And this is just showing you again the ptosis. You can see how hard he's trying to lift his, to open his eyebrows. He's using his entire forehead to try and lift his eyebrows up. That's why there's so much of furrowing, but there's nothing happening. Okay. So these are the three types of, uh, okay. I think we can cover this one quickly. All right. The boom slung or the hemotoxic. All right. So um, your patients get a bit of vomiting, nausea, dizziness, but this is where the problem comes. They just start oozing from the wound. Okay. No matter what you do, you just can't stop it. And we know us, we'll give cyclocapron, FTPs, pressure bands, does that. It just doesn't stop bleeding, all right? And in fact, they get what we, a lot of gingival bleeding. So they just start bleeding around the mouth, all right? So it takes up to 24 hours for the hemotoxic symptoms to really kick in, okay? And then once they start bleeding, they bleed from everywhere. They just bleed, all right? And eventually they start bleeding in the brain. And eventually they start bleeding Wherever it's, wherever it's possible to bleed from, they will bleed, and all the organs eventually shut down. They just become a bag of blood if you don't treat them, okay? So you have to be a bit careful. So here we can see the papura, okay? Here we can see the actual bleeding from the wound. Uh, does this look like normal blood? It actually looks like tomato sauce, okay? Because there's nothing to help it clot. So it's just free flowing. No matter what you do, you can't stop it. You know, Even if it lands on the floor, it's not going to clot. It's just going to stay like that. That's why it looks so different. And there's the gingival ooze that you see as well. Okay. So patient's INR will be deranged. You can do something that they call a bedside whole blood clotting test. Right. Basically, you take a yellow tube that has nothing in it. So blood should clot in it. You take it and you leave it in a room for 20 minutes. Okay, normally, if you then turn that, that blood should have clotted. 
if you are not, if you suspect, let's say you suspect a worm's lung, so you're doing this test, when you turn it, the blood will just move free because it hasn't clotted. So that's the type of bedside test that you can do, all right? So this is what happens with the worm's lung, okay? With the hemotoxic snake, the blood just moves freely, whereas we expect it to clot, okay? So these are just some of the signs and the symptoms. Uh, the natal black snake, like I told you, nothing to worry about. You just get a bit of regional lymphadenopathy. There's a bit of pain, fever, blistering and necrosis at the site, but nothing much else. All right. So in other words, a black snake, black natal black snake, nothing to worry about. You treat the patient for their symptoms. You keep them for observation, just in case, you know, you, you suspect you might have made a mistake. All right. So we'll stop there. There's still quite a bit to cover, uh, but it's going to take quite a long time to cover. <laughs> so at least today you'll learn the types of snakes what they cause and which ones cause what, okay? So it's something just to keep in mind. No matter where you go in the world, you'll always find these variations of these, all right? And you have some snakes that are exceptionally venomous, but they also still fall into one of these three categories, all right? Generally, the neurotoxic are the ones that are the, regarded as the most venomous, the ones that can kill you and things like that. Uh, but the hemotoxic also falls under that. So like I say, the American Viper, for example, in the Midwest, uh, extremely hemotoxic, you know, and they worry about it all the time. So, you know, it depends where you go to work. That's what you'll see. Okay. So uh, any questions? Seriously? Wow. There'd be loads of questions. Yes. Yes, they don't have venom control. You are 100% right. So the smaller they are, the more dangerous they are. Uh, so you do have to be careful. Um, oh, I um, so you're 100% right. Just like our kids, you know. Uh, if your kid comes to punch you, generally they'll use a large amount of force they can't control. So you're right, juvenile snake, well, not necessarily uh, infant snakes, but you're right, let's say teenage snakes are more likely to give you a venomous bite as compared to a, uh, what you call it, dry bite. Whereas the older ones, or a full adult would rather give you a dry bite and warn you instead of uh, giving you a full venomous bite. Right? So the question is, what happens with a dry bite? With a dry bite, generally you get pain, and a bit of swelling and things like that, but it doesn't seem to progress further, but we always watch our patients and things like that, All right? Um, so, I mean, it's an interesting topic. There's a lot of studies that have gone into it, and hopefully the next time we cover this, which will be in about three weeks time, we'll get to uh, treatments and things like that, you know? Uh, unless we finish this up next week, I don't know, what do you guys think? No, it's up to you all. Okay, we'll finish this off next week. Next week, Thursday, we'll just finish off the snakes and we'll get back to ECGs and all that other boring stuff again. Okay, no problem. All right, so I just want to thank everybody for coming. I, uh, we're okay in our new room. It's not as nice as that board, but you know, I think when we cover, yeah, that's for sure. At least you can see what's happening. So uh, welcome to our late comments. Sorry, we'll post it on the group. You will see everything. Don't worry. Okay. Um, almost all the good parts about Victoria's Secret and all that stuff that we are talking about. But anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. So we'll end it there for now. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay. So we'll see you guys next week for the conclusion, the exciting conclusion of snakes. Okay. Right. Bye.